folks? Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick. It's time for this week's Friday Morning GM with co-host Voss Laricos. Voss, how you doing? Doing well, Ken. Enjoyed the combine. Looking forward to the first wave of free agency next week. Um, so exciting time of year for roster construction enthusiasts. How are you? I, doing doing well. And I, I I urge people to next week not be just trying to hit that F5 key every I have the creek correct, right? It's not F4 or F5. I think it's F5 to refresh your screen. Um, it, it not Don't hit the, re-hit that every two seconds for free agents. You're not going to be satisfied with what the Ravens are doing, probably. Uh, the Ravens are still very tight against the cap, even though they, have, they got a little bit of flexibility to make them out of BK deal, which is certainly something uh, we're going to be talking about a little later on this show. Yes, surely. Surely. No, I don't expect it to be uh, an active, but yeah, we'll circle back to that later. So let's talk a little combine here. And and I really kind of want to focus on the offensive tackle spot because I think that's where I think that's the Ravens' greatest priority. They, you know, they can use a wide receiver, they can use a cornerback, they can use an edge rusher, and they'll have a chance, hopefully, to get some players who might be able to help them uh in later rounds through free agency, in particular for the pass rushing group. But at offensive tackle, there's no substitute for drafting a left tackle. 100% agree there. I, I think it is an equal tier need to receiver and corner in particular. However, there's more scarcity of tackles, so that makes it more of a priority need, as you said. The thing that first takeaway I had from, you know, just watching the combine and seeing the, the measurements and, and how these gentlemen move through the drills, there's really only three true left tackles in the first round. Um, Alt, uh, Fatuanu, and Fashanu. Mm-hmm. Those are really three, and then you have you know four four right tackles, and then maybe three or four interior guys. You know, Alton Fashano are the guys who are, in my opinion, ready on day one to 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 play. Uh, Fatano is a is a step behind. I'm having the second tier: J.C. Latham of Alabama, Tyler Guyton of Oklahoma. Um, I have seen Talisa Fuaga, the Oregon State guy, higher in people's rankings. I got to say, I think there's a chance he ends up at guard. Daniel Jeremiah has already said, it looks like he'll be a good guard and, and arm length would tell you that's, that's going to be more likely true than not. I would say I could still end up at right tackle or whatever, but that still limits him and he doesn't exactly meet the left tackle need. Um, And then you have a, you have a, a set of guys who are developmental but have a very high ceiling. And, and the guys, the three guys I would put in there specifically, all of, all of whom I think will be taken in the first 50 picks, are Kingsley Sua Matai, Mataia uh, from BYU. And he started for just two years. Patrick Paul of Houston um, and Amarius Mims of Georgia, of course, has only started eight college games so far. So very limited playing time, but really was the freak of this combine in terms of, of size and uh, um, a couple of other measurables. Yes, sure was. Uh, first, just to circle back to Fuaga, I agree he's right tackle is best case. And I think, you know, a guard is probably, he looks like a guard. He just has the mm-hmm. build of a guard. He's, um, he's built like a pair. He's built like a gourd and, and that's ideal guard shape to have that weight in the hips. Agreed. Agreed. So, uh, I'd also throw in um, Kieran, and I'm not going to pr- try to pronounce his last name, A-M-E-N, from uh, Yale, who's another developmental tackle, left tackle. Uh, mm-hmm. But um, Kingsley from BYU is apparently gaining some steam, at least as far as mock drafts, this week as a potential pick at 30 for the Ravens. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess all that being said, the point is it's a very deep offensive tackle class, offensive line class but there's no guarantee that it's going to be a left tackle. And I think there's questionable whether taking a guard at pick 30 is good value. Oh, I, 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 the biggest guard story I have, the biggest, one of the biggest draft stories that I've told a number of times so that people know it from this show is, is when the Ravens were drafting 29 in 2007 and they got Ben Grubbs with that pick, the guy I really wanted was Joe Staley. And mm-hmm. of course, the 49ers jumped up as soon as number 28 was was on the clock, traded for that pick, took Joe Staley and and made me, you know, go into conniptions, basically. <laughs> and I, I, was, I was very upset about that. And Ben Grubbs didn't end up being a bad player and probably not even terrible value at 30, given he gives you five good offensive line seasons at guard. Uh, Mike Preston still or, or he did for a long time claim he was still better than Yanda, which is ridiculous. Right. 
but, right. <laughs> but it was uh uh he was you know he was a, a, a decent value player but if they could have had staley i mean their left tackle situation would have been fixed for a long time oh yeah what staley played for about a the dozen years yeah, if I recall. Yeah. Yeah. So uh yeah, good class again. Um, you know, I, I it would have been maybe more beneficial if uh Fatuanu didn't test quite as well. He was really shuffling his feet and mirroring well in pass protection, maybe give you a better chance of him falling down to 30 from a Ravens perspective. I don't think there's I don't think there's gonna be a home run tackle in 30, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I, I and I would agree. I think also though the Ravens, they probably weren't gonna get that no matter what. And I think mm-hmm. that the Ravens are very fortunate. This is as deep a class as it is. Maybe even they can trade back or take a project at 30. But they need a guy who could be ready to play in 2025, not 2024. So they don't need to get Alt or Fashanu or Fatano if you believe he's that guy to, to, to jump in and play the first year. Um, they just need somebody who's ready in 25, and, and that will allow them to keep Ronnie Stanley, for you know, provided they keep Ronnie Stanley for the year, I should say. Um, if they did, if they somehow got Joe Waltz and, and you know, there's a pot mask video or something that has Joe <laughs> all dropping to 30, <laughs> uh, then, you know, you, you could you could feel I think they'd feel pretty good about letting Ronnie Stanley go if they had to do that. But I, I personally, the barriers to entry at uh, at left tackle are so high that I think it'd be very foolish to let Ronnie go for an eight point three million dollar savings. I would agree with that. I think uh, it's seeming like the rate the team wants to try to get it to agree to a pay cut. I've seen that mentioned quite a bit. Uh, Jonas Schaefer wrote that up in his article. I think he proposed a six million dollar pay cut with a chance to earn it back in incentives. Um, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. We'll probably have some clarity on that situation relatively soon. But um, yeah, uh, I, f- I had a few other takeaways from the uh, combine. Unless you uh, had anything else on the offensive tackles. So the way it's shaking out. You know, past defenders, the Ravens could use an edge or a corner, certainly. Um, I think we've identified, I'm pretty much in the market of tapping that efficiency of the veteran edges available. Yeah. And, you know, you already have some young guys. You already have Ojabo who's a developmental DPR. Um, you know, you had Turner and Verse tested really well, and Robinson, Chop Robinson. I don't think they're necessarily going to be there, and I'm not sure I would even necessarily want Chop Robinson at 30. Uh, the other guy is Latu, who is um, a technician but has significant medical history with a potential, you know, spinal injury that he came back from. Same thing at corner. Um, You know, Arnold and Mitchell really have solidified themselves at the top of the cornerback board, probably both gone in the top 15 or 20. Um, Rake Estrell did not have the best combine. Seems more suited to a slot. Wiggins is, um, you know, got hurt, ran a blazing 40. I'd probably be probably a good pick at 30, but not a home run necessarily. Um, some oh, I'd love that pick of 30 if they could get him, but I, I, I don't know okay. if they will. Yeah, sure. Um, Lassiter is probably another guy to keep in mind is in a trade back scenario. And then most of the other corners are slot shape and slot size and slot experience. So not the deepest corner class. All that to say, I think there's a decent chance a wide receiver will be the best player available on the board at 30. Yeah, and I, obviously BPA is going to drive some of their needs, uh, some of their uh, selections. But in order to draft for needs, one of the tools they have in their toolbox is to trade down. And so uh, and it, it makes all sorts of sense in terms of them getting more value, believing in flatter valuation. Trades are probably going to be made at JJ values. And you, and you probably end up getting more player value. You, you might miss out on a peak player, you might miss out on an all pro player by, by not taking your pick at 30. But I, I generally like the strategy of, of trading down. The Ravens always seem to get a, basically an even match on the JJ value. And they're going to, they believe in the flatter valuations, which is very clear from the, from the fact that they trade down almost exclusively in, in, in terms sure. of their history. Yeah. Very, very few trade ups early on. I mean, they'll trade up once in a while for a guy they want to grab, and gave up a little capital, you know, it's a, as Costa says, you know, it's a, uh, what does he call it? You know, it's a, what's, what's the term I'm looking for? The business it's uh, the, taking swings, not the dartboard. Cause I know you don't like that one, but the other yeah, one, not, he it's, says uh, lottery ticket. And I say it's more like world series of poker entries. Right. So you want more entries. That's the point yeah. I'm trying to make. Yeah. Um, I personally would be strongly in favor of uh, either, um, after the big three are gone, a receiver, but Mitchell, not Mitchell, 
Yeah, Adonai Mitchell and Brian yeah. Thomas from LSU. If they're at 30, I think they'd be great to provide that element to the offense. And also, people talk about surplus value. Um, Rashad Bateman's fifth-year option, assuming you take a receiver in the first round, you're not picking up that option. You're gaining that money back to the cap. It's a pretty clear demonstration of surplus value there. Final thought on the combine, a pretty good group of height, weight, speed running backs, eight running backs with a sub-4540. Um, in the combine, I think there's a good chance you can find a, a contributor to your rotation uh, in round four or five. Yeah, they, I, there's there's guys to choose from. And DaCosta has come out and said that it's not a real deep running back class. I think what he's saying is that it's not a really top heavy right. There's not a, not two or three Bijan Robinson and all Guyer and those guys. They're, they're not running around in this draft. They they have a, you know less talent at the very top, but they do have you know every year. They have running backs they like, and they've done a wonderful job of finding them. And I'm just, I'm maybe a little bit concerned that the success of Mitchell and Mostert, and also Achan, who was drafted high, but the other two were, were UDFAs, um, is going to push teams to be more willing to accept less size for more speed. So those right. guys, those players. Uh, where you make that compromise, uh, I think you're going to be in higher demand this year. Yeah, Guarnado, I believe, from Louisville, uh, ran a really fast 40, and he's probably a guy that will be pushed up on the, uh, you know, from the historical success or the recent success of those guys you just mentioned. Yeah. Well, let's move on, talk a little bit about Justin Matabike, uh, tagged on Tuesday. And I think that now the next question is the tag has happened, but there's still a huge what comes next with with Justin Matabike. And obviously this the Ravens are right now and they have to by the league year, they have to they have to get their cap situation proper. But they're currently at approximately minus 10 million in terms of cap. Yes. Uh 9.97 according to Brian McFarland. They have to be in compliance by next Wednesday, 313. So they got to come up with about 10 million here. I think there's three easy avenues to do it. Not necessarily easy, but three main avenues to do it. Lamar restructure frees up $11 million. Um, that would be one of the best options. Justin Matabike extension could free up about $10 million. Now, it's, you're, all this money has to be paid back. You want to make that clear. Extensions, void years, restructures, they're all different vehicles to keep, borrow from the future. Well, a Matabike extension is is a good one in the sense that it, it it keeps Matabike in Baltimore for more years than just one. Also, so yes, there are extensions like like restructures and simple restructures as they're called, where you pay effectively give the player a check for his entire salary at the beginning of the year and treat it as a signing bonus and move that money to the future. That's just borrowing from the future. That's not creating any additional play value. At least a Matabike extension creates play value. Right. Sure, I understand that. But if he's if his contract comes in at, at 25, 20 million a year and his cap hit the first year is ten million, that ten, that other ten million is going to be paid back in the future at some point. And the third is to make a couple cuts. Um Bowser and Ricard together get you to nine and a half million. You could probably find a way, maybe a Justice Hill uh a, a small little move around with his money or something to get you to the ten. But that's just to just to get you in compliance. That's not accounting for in-season contingency, signing the draft class, um, and signing any other free agents or retaining anybody else. So a lot of, a lot of work to be done there. We, we kind of knew this ahead of time, that this was going to be a large pig in the python that was going to be difficult for the Ravens to digest in terms of their other offseason moves. It basically precludes them from making other early free agency moves, which, by the way, given their comp, situation right now i don't think they're really eager to do to 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 to, you know have some offsets to the current set of compensatory picks they're looking at getting but they but i i I, they don't want to have a uh a a situation where uh they're they're can't make any moves when they present themselves uh and 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 it really will either take a a a restructure of matabeke a multi-year deal with him or potentially a trade of him if that were the case, I did see, by the way, some good discussion about what Matabike's trade value might be. And I, I want to get your your thoughts on that if they if they decide they can't come to a long-term deal and they have to trade him. Um, I think my opinion is, has changed a little bit on Matabike throughout the course of the last few months. 
some of the advanced metrics made me think he's a little bit more valuable and does a little bit more of his autonomous of his work and his production autonomously. So I would probably be, um, I think you got to get an early second round pick. I think at this point, I've, I've sort of come around to the idea of a meta BK uh, led front with Travis Jones and a Dafe away and a veteran on the other side, and that really comprising a strong foundation for a consistent pass rush over a, a multi-year uh, period. Yeah, I mean, love love the guy as a as a player. Obviously, uh, there was a lot of cleanup activity that that did that. I I you know, in some ways, he could become a better pass rusher this next year, and I think he could take a, a big step back in terms of the number of sacks still. So he, right. he just may not be working. Uh, to me, one of the guys who who the Matabike contract impacts is Clowney. So if they mm-hmm. want to get Clowney back, and I really would love for them to find a way to do that, then they need to come up with some money for that. And and that means you know a, a, a change has to be made. I, I don't personally believe Ronnie Stanley is going to be cut. And the other two guys they have are also tackles, Moses and McCary, who are a significant component of the money besides Ricard, as you mentioned. Um, I, but, I don't see I, – I guess I could see cutting McCary as me, maybe the most likely of those three tackles. I know I'm probably alone in that regard, but I think Stanley's the obvious left tackle. If you draft your left tackle, you might be you might feel like you're in a position to cut McCary at that point or or maybe – Trade him. McCary. Or trade him. You trade McCary. I think you could probably get a third-round pick or a day three pick for McCary just because of the scarcity of tackles, and he's you know league average, a little bit below league average – Teams are not every team has that. So I, I don't want to deal away tackles unless you have to. I mean, they're just so so precious and so hard to find. Um it's a good point. What so, a six maybe for for McCary would might be reasonable. Uh, because we've seen that the 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 end of camp market is typically a, a seven or a conditional seven for whoever you're gonna end up cutting. But in the case of of left tackle, it's usually one round higher, is what right, I've seen. Right. It's usually a six. Right, I think McCary have a lot more value than uh, an Alex Lewis or some of the other, yeah. just or Jermaine Illuminor, some of the guys they gave away for peanuts. So, um, yeah, it's it's the biggest question, um, biggest question. But having a not a top strong necessarily elite too deep at tackle, but having a capable stable group too deep at tackle, it's a pretty good place to be. All right. A uh, number of other cuts across the league. I guess we're ready to move on to that. I, and the one thing that really stands out is it's a good year to cut a safety. Yes, <laughs> like, sir. Uh, the yes, Seahawks sir. Uh, leading the charge there, cutting both Jamal Adams and Condre Diggs. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, what do you, when you look at that market, do they need a Zoom call of their own now? I don't know. So today, Denver cut uh, Jeffrey's uh, Justin Simmons, who's mm-hmm. been an All-Pro. Jordan Poyer was cut by Buffalo. Kevin Micah Bayard Hyde. was Micah. I, Hyde, I thought Hyde was UFA. And Bayard uh, from Philly, who was traded from Tennessee. Um, and that's on top of, according to PFF, there's already 11 safeties in their top 150 of free agents. So it's a very flooded market of safeties. Um could present an opportunity for the Ravens to dive in with players that either don't affect the compensatory formula because they've been cut or waiting until the third or fourth wave where the formula has already, you know, run its course. Um, but yeah, it's, it's uh, a lot of cuts and a lot of safeties out on their, uh, you know, out of work right now. So Geno Stone potentially affected by this. He's a guy obviously who's in now a very crowded safety market. Do you think this might increase the chance slightly that Gino will be back with the Ravens? I think he could, but as I alluded to in the last episode, I think when you're adding a Matabike and an additional cornerstone contract, you have to tighten your belt a little bit for the second contract, guys. You're still going to be able to, you're still going to, I think the Ravens are still going to be very active in the third and fourth contract market, but those second contract guys that can bring you back a compensatory pick that costs a little bit more because of their age, um, that's somewhere you probably have to save a little bit i i you know obviously my philosophy entirely is about where can you save but it, it, with in stone's case i think it'd have to be a case of he drops into their price range and he's the he's the one free agent the ravens have got out there on the market now 
who I have no idea what his value is. And it's become less clear in the last 24 hours with these safety cuts. Uh, it could be that the top end of the safety market actually improves Stone's value because a lot of these teams are missing safeties now and they see right. a Geno Stone and you can get him for three years, 12 million or something. Or it could be, you know, I, I, I would have been of the opinion before all these cuts occurred that Geno Stone could have been, you know, a seven or $8 million a year guy potentially. Um, right. But it's not out of the question you know, he had a lot of tackling issues last year, and it's not out of the question. He comes back to the Ravens, and it's, you know, the Ravens maybe give him an out-the-door offer that's like three years, seven and a half million, three years, eight million, something like that. Um, and he comes back to the Ravens and says, you know, is that offer still good? Because I'll, I'll, I'll take it now. Yeah, well, it's certainly possible. I could also see him going to Seattle with Mike McDonald. You know, they, they need safeties, obviously, now. And I'm sure McDonald wants to bring a couple guys, if he can, to help kind of instill his culture and help with the communication of his scheme and that sort of thing. Um, a couple offensive linemen cut, not a ton. Um, 11 offensive guards in PFF's top 150, so that's a pretty deep group. Um, only seven corners, a little shallow there. 11 running backs, very strong there. And 24 outside linebackers in the top 150. So, uh, you know, when you're looking at these these numbers, to me, it's stay patient, stay patient, stay patient, stay patient, stay patient at running back, outside linebacker, safety, offensive guard, corner. Preserve those comp picks. You know, you could get, you know, a third or a fourth for PQ and then a fifth for Zeitler, maybe a sixth, fifth or sixth or for Geno, maybe even something for Simpson with this kind of – uh roster construction you gotta you gotta accumulate as many picks as you can going forward yeah they they can't get anything for odell now with the restructure they did but honestly i don't think there was anything that was going to be coming for odell and if it would have been it probably would have been a seventh or something so even the 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 restructure you could argue would be is more value to the team than the than the seventh round pick um Mm -hmm. but anyway it's it's a uh it's it's an interesting group i i I don't expect anybody like gus edwards or uh dobbins or anybody like that is going to generate a pick um i guess it's you never know for sure but i think it's unlikely at the running back position that anyone's going to give them a lot of money i can't see it i mean you you know you look at all the you know running backs maybe mid-round running backs at the combine and then 11 running backs in the top 150. I mean, there's just no reason to jump the gun at all there. You wait till the market settles, wait till fourth wave and get somebody cheap and keep those comp picks. Yeah, well, completely agree. And I, I'm I'm in favor of not even signing a veteran running back at all. Like they, they go okay. to look at other people's R and one cuts, um, which they'll have a they'll have a chance to get some other teams R and one cuts. Look at the UDFA market, find the stylistic fit for your offense. And Lamar Jackson lifts all boats, and you can you've proven before that you can find value there. And you've also proven before pretty decisively that you can't find value with veteran backs. Who's the veteran back the Ravens have picked the last several years? And they've had a bunch of them and a bunch of former all pros who really said, Yeah, we need another year of that guy. I mean, I think Ingram his first year, but that was more for his receiving. I thought that really what he brought was the receiving. That was the big, you know, what he was better at than Gus. Yeah, there's few and far between. And when you can get a Justin Forsett, you know, I know we're going back a few years now, but, you know, from the scrap heap, it's just, I don't know. Yeah, Justin Forsett, a rare veteran scrap heap guy, though. Ingram, uh, you know, in the, in the I guess I would say the same sort of category, though he they gave him a little bit of a contract. Um, but but they, I, I mean, the R and one scrap heap is how they got players like Collins. Um, it's how Mostert got taken away from the Ravens. You know, it's, right. it's just there's there's real opportunity there. Just find the guy who fits your stylistic need and plug him into the system with Lamar Jackson. He's immediately going to be quite good. Uh, we do have to worry the offensive line might not be as good this year. I think that's needs to be an area of greater focus. But I still don't think the Ravens are going after a guard. Yes, I, unless somebody comes super cheap. I mean, there are some pretty good guys in the in their you know middle of their career, the prime of their career. Uh, Jackson from Detroit. They have uh, from Dotson from the Rams, who was yeah. trader, and he had a good year. But I don't know. I, I really don't think you, you can afford to spend a lot of money at guard with the way this roster is already kind of uh, you know allocated. So it's uh, again. 
patience. I, I could, other years I've said let's let's dip in. They got the, they have to make a splash. Not have to make a splash, but they need a, a playmaker. They need a difference maker. They had the difference makers already for the most part. I think they could line up today and they'd have a a wild card level team. You know, well better than that because the other teams aren't having filled out their roster. The one position where they need a player, I think, a starter is outside linebacker. And other than that, you know, the other uh, twenty two are pretty pretty solid. Well, let's move on. Uh, talk a little bit about the deal for Nelson Aguilar. And I know Brian McFarlane had some interesting information about this additionally in terms of the 24 cap cost, but they've dipped back into the void year methodology with Aguilar's contract. Right. So $1.2 million base, $2.5 million bonus spread out over four void or four years, four void years. So they're pushing just under 2 million into the future. Not a lot of money, uh, but is this the new normal that that because a lot of people are waiting to see was that a one-time thing last year or this the new normal so uh maybe an indication there yeah i think my guess is they just can't chew through it all in one year is the problem that that you know they had what 20 million or something pretty close to that in terms of total void dollars primarily on the beckham deal but there was other stuff too and it's just even with an increase in the cap you still have a veteran team and a contending team, and you, you just it's not going to be possible to chew through all that in one year. And I, I do want them to get back to zero in terms of, of void year dollars at some point in the future, but it may take several years. And I, I you know, get used to the notion that this is going to be a year of austerity for the Baltimore Ravens, that they don't have a lot of money to spend and, and they have less relative money to spend and in, in, you know with with big differences in cap across the uh, across the league even if the, the the money helped them to get mad at BK um it's it's going to be tight and and uh you know if you're saying oh we got to do something to get over the hump and whatnot well th- th- just start with the fact the Ravens are going to have a less talented team in 24 than they will in 23 it's a fact of life uh and and you know is there, I don't even see that the individual players, who are going to jump forward in some way. You know, you can point to Travis Jones if you wanted to. You talk to Mitchell, maybe playing more time um, this next year. But I don't see the individual players who are, who are going to jump forward this year, um, much less, um, you, you know, how the Ravens will be better as a team as a whole. I agree. You know, they don't have that, that pipeline of, uh, well, Simpson will step in, but they didn't have a mm-hmm. second-round pick last year because of the Roquan trade. You know, the th- it's all relative, right? How how talented is your team? I I, and I never agreed with uh, well, the 2011 Ravens were more talented than the 2012. So, it but the 2012 stacked up better against the other teams in 2012 than 2011, hypothetically. So if Buffalo's cutting players and Miami's cutting players and KC's losing players and Cleveland's losing players and Cincinnati's losing players, then maybe you're less talented, but maybe you're still among the top three of the conference. So to me, it's the, the key is you're going to be less talented, but maintain talent in the positions where you need to, and you can let the talent slide a little bit at running back and will and maybe safety and guard. That's kind of how I would approach it. Yeah. All right. Well, I certainly have some money tied up in that safety position right now, especially relative to the rest of the league. Uh, Jamison Hensley and Jeff Zrebeck both came out with some UFA predictions. I know you wanted to talk about that for a minute. Take us through it. Yeah, I thought it was interesting. Um, Hensley just identified three players that he thought he would keep, and they're the exact three that you and I ID'd, I think, two shows ago. Clowney, Darby, and Malik Harrison were his three. Mm-hmm. And then Zarebek went through the whole list, all 20, and he is projecting that they're going to keep, again, Clowney, Darby, Malik Harrison, Delshawn Phillips, Daryl Worley, Sam Mustafer, and Brent Urban, and everybody else walks. That that's just a Rebex um, sort of uh, prognostication. Just overall, I just kind of feel like the way this all season shapes up in terms of what the Ravens need, where is the talent in free agency, and where is the talent in the draft. I think you spend your most of your free agent money on the defense, and you draft primarily on offense. It looks to align that best that way. Yeah, I, I, I you know, the Rebex got a good list, and Jeff's always quite good, so I'm, I'm not surprised by that. One thing he filled out very well in that group 
is the Ravens' entire handshake crew is there. So <laughs> yep. the, the handshake crew, literally, I mean, Malik Harrison could be signed for two years, by the way, or he could be signed for one. But it's the kind of player I think you you probably want to make a two-year commitment at just over the vet minimum for. So $250,000 signing bonus, $200,000 signing bonus, two years of the vet min. Um, and then you can't cut him because of that. But you've got Brent Urban. You're immediately, I mean, he's he's a one-year-at-a-time completely fungible roster spot who helps you get an extra guy onto your roster for the year. The Ravens are e- extraordinarily good at that. Daryl Worley. Nobody had more transactions in a season than Daryl <laughs> Worley did two years ago. So Daryl Worley is, is a guy they'll cut for sure at the end of the roster. Um, uh, and Sam Mustafer is a guy I didn't even know they could cut last year because I thought he was a fourth-year player and that's the way he was listed. But apparently something gave him an extra year of eligibility and he, and he uh, sorry, an extra year of service time credit. And so he he was a he was cut I, I, and I still don't understand it as a uh, um, as a veteran, and I think he's clearly a guy that gets cut as a veteran, handshake right back onto the team again as as the you know eighth offensive lineman probably in this group, a guy who can fill in at either guard or center, um, but is primarily the, the the backup center, and I, I, it's. <laughs> It's that it sounds like a very I, I completely concur with Jeff's selections in terms of who they really want back. Yeah, and there's been I don't know what it is this week, but all of a sudden there's a lot of pessimism. The Ravens don't have any money. I mean, I think most people that were kind of following it already knew that, but there's pessimism. But if you bring back Clowney, Darby, and Harrison, basically your only need on the entire defense is a safety, um, immediate need. And then on offense, yeah, you need some offensive line help and another receiver, but that's that's doable in the draft. I I, mm-hmm. I, I think people are getting a little carried away with the pessimism, some folks. Yeah, and they they need running backs, of course. They probably need two running backs, and they probably do need two safeties, not just one. Maybe Worley is one of two, or maybe he's actually one of three that you mm-hmm. that you want to get. But the, admittedly, that the, you know your your need as you go further down the totem pole at a lot of these positions, whether it's safety or running back is less and less in terms of of what you can accept except more just stylistic fits and less the you know a, a, a player who's a, a a complete game changer um the Ravens have those and you you mentioned earlier I mean they they have Kyle Hamilton they have Roquan Smith and they have Justin Matabike um and that's a that's a great place to start in terms of of uh who you have Adafi Owe you might put in that group so Marcus uh, Williams Marlon Humphrey Brandon Stevens I mean they have some players on defense yeah I sure did. Well, one of the interesting things I saw this week um, posted, and this is this is a I will not mention the service that posted this article, but I will say there's a general category of articles now that seems to show up whenever I I turn on my phone and I click over to the internet, I get a, a, a general set of articles that's basically like you know former All Pro Browns linebacker you know uh, predicted to Ravens. That's it's like the format of the article thing. I hope you guys aren't doing that at Beatdown. I honestly, I, no. I I don't know, but but there's so much of that, and and all it is is the author is is examining the thing, and I don't know who came up with the with the title. Maybe they they tell them that's how to title these things, and it's just it's it's garbage reporting. <laughs> I mean, it's it because it's not, and it 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 does a terrible job of considering how the player actually impacts this team or would be a value to the team. I mean, it's just, and, and by the way, it's universal. It's across all sports, seeing it all sorts of starting pitchers predicted to the Orioles, pr- pr- pretty much every starting pitcher out there, you know, of any value. But the big one this week, Devin White to the Ravens. Yeah. Lazy journalism, in my opinion. You know, it just seems that another one I saw today was Josh Jacobs for the Ravens. It just seems like these these some of these, you know, analysts, if you want to call them that, look around the league and say, okay, here's a linebacker with name recognition. Where who what team what team likes linebackers? Oh, the Ravens like linebackers. What team runs the ball a lot? Oh, the Ravens run the ball more than most. So let's let's link every single running back on the free agent market to the Ravens and make that case. It's just lazy to me, and it doesn't. When you're trying to build a roster efficiently, when you which you have to do all the time, especially with a franchise quarterback, you just can't afford. That's just silly to me. It's it's formulaic uh, writing too, because they're basically they're they're doing the same thing in each of these articles. I it may even be somewhat written by AI. I really don't know. But they're but they're they're basically are saying if if you if you set into your AI program or typed into your your AI bot your AI uh, you know 
whatever you're using for AI, make a case for Derrick Henry to be a Raven. You know, it'll spit out a bunch of information about it, probably in prosaic form, I'm guessing. Uh, and, and you wouldn't have to do too much to it to, to make it into an article. And that may be what's going on here. But uh, the idea of Devin White being Raven is so heinously stupid um, that I, I can't get past it. He, he look back at White's career. He was awarded an, a second team all pro in 2020 based almost, almost entirely on the fact that he had nine sacks. It was, you know, it was good Tampa Bay defense. Um, and, and they created a lot of opportunities for him. It, it, it's be much like if Patrick queen was allowed to run wild for a year. Mm-hmm. Um, but white much more deficient as a run defender even than Queen, and Queen has had his problems over the years, a tackler and whatnot. But he's White is far more deficient as a as right. Can't get off blocks. Doesn't have good recognition to start with. Has always been a really lousy coverage guy as well. So it's you know that's not something he brings to the table. It's all about like getting sacks from that inside linebacker spot. Um, he's also uh, been an off and on tackler. Did not have a terrible year last year, but but as has not generally been great over his career. But I, I just I. I, I don't think he'd be an upgrade on Simpson necessarily. In fact, I think right. you know the, the chance for 2024 only. I don't. I, it's not clear to me who would be better that year in terms of value, but it is clear to me that Simpson's about a fifth the cost. Yes, I completely agree with every word you said. There makes absolutely no sense at all to me. And I, you know, I agree with you. There's too much of that sort of clickbaity kind of stuff all all around now, even on Twitter and. NFL RUMS and, you know, just spitting up nonsense and trying to generate it. And I guess it's a fun exercise to think about. But even with the running backs, the common thing is, wow, wouldn't it be fun to see Derrick Henry in the same backfield with Lamar? Wouldn't it? Wouldn't this be so much fun to see Josh Jacobs? We're not looking for fun. <laughs> We're trying to build the best roster. You know, the objective is not let's see how fun this experiment is. We're trying to build the best roster. It just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, I think. The best way I heard it stated, at least the case for Derrick Henry, it was by Gordon McGinnis. And he said mm-hmm. that I'd like to see – I, I I think the reason he to sign Derrick Henry just to, to run the experiment once of what it means to have a big name in the backfield – who, who, with Lamar Jackson, to see if that actually, you know, elevates both both players or, or the offense or whatever. And I'm, I'm obviously butchering exactly the way he said it. Uh, it's, it's not a terrible thought, but it just gets away from from trying to be a general manager in the league. I mean, you, you, if if you're if you're general manager in the league, your first question is the ca- your first constraint is the cap. And you have to figure out how do I how do I deal with the limited resources I have in terms of cap and draft capital and deploy them as best I can. And I, the Ravens have proven year after year that their ability to find those running backs who fit their stylistic need is just at a much higher level than their ability to go out and get veteran running backs and make them produce in our system. Yeah, the time to make that experiment was there when Lamar was still on his rookie contract, if at all. Yeah. Now that he now he's in his prime, you got to try to maximize every year. This isn't um, let's let's do an let's, let's just throw this year away for it to make do an experiment type of deal. So, so the folks out there, just don't fall for it, damn it! <laughs> it is quickly. <laughs> don't do it. A hundred percent. Uh, Voss, always a pleasure to do this show with you. Uh, I hope we can do this for years. But uh, tell folks where they can talk football with you and read your other writing. Absolutely. At Vasilis Pitown on Twitter, X, V A S I L I S Pitown, editor, co managing editor, and author for Baltimore Pitown blog. Uh, your, our friend Josh is starting a new series, Realistic Targets, UFA Targets from Other Teams at uh, Every Position. Just put the first one out today. So I recommend everybody checking that out. Yep. Jo- Josh Reed uh, was on the Recollection series, which I'm going to try and plug here right now. I just want to make sure I have it right who he did. Yeah, he did Paul Kruger. So that's coming up uh, pretty soon. And an uh, interesting, interesting case. But I'm looking for people who want to talk about one Raven from the distant past. Um, I, and it doesn't have to be the distant past. It could be fairly recent. But but uh, ideally, I'm trying to get some of the pre-2000 players as well. Just have to have two or three memories of the guy, and we'll talk about it a little bit, talk about how they fit into the defense or the offense or whatever they played, and um, would love to meet some new people from this process, would love to get some new people to uh, have a chance to talk on air about their favorite Ravens and hopefully create some interesting content that's about 15 to 20 minutes long. So not a lot of prep 
for, for, for this sort of thing. Anyway, if you're interested, give me your player by Twitter DM. I'll get right back to you and I'll make sure you uh, uh, have that locked down and, and we, we can schedule a time. For Vassal Ricos, this is Ken McCusick saying goodbye. We'll talk to you next week on Friday Morning GM.